unplugged in, restoring the global supply chain. We see consuming nations really seeing a jolt to the economic system, meaning folks are buying a lot of products and bringing cargo in. In the post-pandemic environment, manufacturers struggle. There is not enough supply to meet rising demand. Our supply chains I liken to finely tuned string instruments. And when they're finely tuned, they sound beautiful and people can enjoy the symphony of life, if you will. However, a little too much tension and those strings start to break. New alternatives and innovations to keep up with deliveries around the world. Unplugged in the global supply chain. Hello and welcome to Plugged In. I'm Greta Van Susteren reporting from Washington, D.C. In February, President Biden said the American people should never face shortages on the goods and services they rely on. He made this remark on the day he signed an executive order, an executive order meant to address a global chip shortage impacting industries ranging from medical supplies to electric vehicles. There is a heightened concern about a lack of semiconductors. Many of the world's chip makers are based in China and Taiwan. The semiconductor delay is impacting everything from cars to computers. VOA's Kevin Enix reports. A year ago, we were talking about the shortage of personal protective equipment from China. The pandemic disrupted that particular supply chain and left first responders struggling to manage the influx of patients showing up in U.S. hospitals. The pandemic disrupted the supply chain in the computer world as well. The U.S. is also reliant on Asian imports of semiconductors and computer chips. COVID-based disruptions quickly led to shortages of inventory in all kinds of markets. The automobile market was particularly hard hit. This is every dealer across the nation. I, I can't tell you how many calls I've gotten from dealers about inventory levels. Pandemic-related shortages prompted the U.S. Congress to introduce legislation designed to invest in more semiconductor manufacturing in the U.S. The so-called CHIPS Act could be finalized by Congress later this month. And despite glitzy events like this at Apple's California campus introducing new products and designs, the chip shortage is impacting the computer world hard. It's going to take a while to sort itself out, months if not a year, to really sort itself out. and so. Again, Apple's not immune. They do, you know, they have the, the luxury of being a massive company with a lot of weight when it comes to dealing with suppliers. There is also concern at the White House. As part of his proposed American Jobs Plan, President Biden has included some $50 billion for initiatives like those in the CHIPS Act. If we're going to maintain our vibrant economy, if we're going to compete in a very competitive world, uh, we, we're going to need to make some strategic investments in things like semiconductor technology and manufacturing. Strategic investments into weak parts of the U.S. supply chain that took a pandemic to expose. Kevin Enix, VUA News, Washington. The Port of Los Angeles is one of the busiest seaports for international trade in the Western Hemisphere. At least 9 million containers moved through the port last year part of an estimated $259 billion in annual trade. The port is located in the San Pedro Bay off the coast of Southern California. The top imported products include furniture, car parts, and electronics, while paper and soybeans are among the top exports. Several of the busiest trade routes extend across North and Southeastern Asia, with China, Japan, and Vietnam listed as top trading partners of 2020. My next guest has more than three decades experience overseeing shipping operations and global logistics. Jean Soroka has served as executive director of the Port of Los Angeles since 2014. We spoke earlier about the latest cargo surge and the impact on the port's workforce and supply chain partners. 
Yeah, the surge will continue. We've got 24 ships scheduled to arrive over the next four days, and including those that are sitting at anchor, we've got cargo that's working consistently to cross our docks. The longshore men and women of the dock workers are averaging more hours on the job than they ever have in recent memory. But that American consumer and the consumer confidence we see will continue throughout the remainder of 2021. I read some time ago that there was a, a bit of a bottleneck, something like four, my number may be wrong, 40 container ships that were sort of waiting to get in to unload. I don't know if that's correct or not, but did you have any bottleneck like that during the pandemic? In, uh, in February, you're exactly correct, Greta. We had 40 container ships sitting just outside the port at anchor waiting for space. And this is a culmination of effects. Our warehouses, some 2 billion square feet of space from the shores of the Pacific out to the Mojave Desert are overflowing with cargo. The next shipment that comes in has to wait for that warehousing space. The trucker has to wait with that container and it backs up to the port and beyond. I take it it's important to move these things quickly because you don't want you don't want to break in that chain. Like if there isn't a truck to pick up the cargo, it doesn't matter if you can unload it. You got no place to put it. That's right. The warehouses have to push the cargo out to the retailers and to you and me, the consuming public. The trucks have to be in motion all the time, as do the rails, and our work on the docks is equally as important. What we've done in the last two months has brought that number from 40 ships sitting in a parking lot down to 14. And we'll continue to see few, if any, ships backed up by the time the month of June comes around. About how many containers come into that port at any given time, whether it's a week, a month? I mean, what? I mean, they're, they're huge uh, containers. So any, any? Can you give me some ballpark number? Since July through April, we're averaging about 900,000 containers per month every month. And to give you perspective, that would be lined up end to end all the way from Los Angeles to New York and halfway back across the country every month. Was there any problem during the pandemic with these containers coming in, the ones that were coming in, with uh, the people who were supposed to unload it? There was a work shortage perhaps because they, they, you know, they, they had COVID or they're afraid of COVID. Did you have any uh, problems unloading these containers? Not really, but your point is well taken that COVID affected our workforce across the board. We here at the Harbor Department, the Port of Los Angeles, have about 50% of our workers still telecommuting and working from home. The other half are police officers and construction folks that have to be out in the field every day. Our longshore workforce, the dock workers, were hit particularly hard in the fourth quarter of 2020 with respect to the coronavirus. So we jumped into action as quickly as possible, getting testing and then ultimately vaccines for those dock workers were now a critical mass are healthy and on the job. At the worst point though, Greta, we probably had five or 6% of our 15,000 strong workforce sick, isolating, or just simply afraid to go to work. So uh, let me go back two years and ask you to compare what was the likely volume two years ago, pre-pandemic, then a year ago when we were in the pandemic, and now as we emerge out of the pandemic. How do you compare the volume? I think choppiness is the way to describe it. We go back to the uh, springtime of 2018 when tariffs were introduced between China and the United States, and we saw a rush of imports, then an ebb, another rush followed by an ebb. In fact, by the end of 2019, our business was down about 16% in the fourth quarter. Then flash forward to the beginning of 2020, and we saw a year that was projected to be fairly normal by all observers until the coronavirus hit in China. And the central government decided let's shelter at home and effectively shutter the manufacturing industry. Our volume dropped by about 50%, five zero, during the first uh, several months of the year and was down about 20% after five months. All right, so when it goes down, let's say 20% or 50%, does it go someplace else or is it just sort of a bottleneck? No, when it goes down that far, it's because you and I were not buying. Uh, we were sheltering at home. Many folks decided that it was better to work from home. We weren't necessarily purchasing at the levels that we had seen before, even though now, as we look back in history, it was a relatively short period of time. But because our service sector had effectively been shuttered at that point in time, all of our money as American consumers 
went straight to the retail sector, to the tangible goods. Egypt's Suez Canal is the shortest maritime link between Europe and Asia. Nearly 12% of global trade passes through the canal. For nearly a week in March, one of the world's biggest container ships became stuck in the canal. It blocked hundreds of ships and created a major supply chain slowdown. A training facility in France is hoping to help mariners avoid a similar predicament. Classes in session at a man-made waterway in the foothills of the French Alps. Here, sailors navigate a 125th scale replica of a section of the Suez Canal. The managing director of the Port Revel Training Facility, Francois Mayor, says the school's design tests a captain's skills. That is in order to put trainees in very realistic conditions. We make them work in normal conditions here, emergency situations where they lose technical means, or they have to deal with the most varied and complex problems we can put in place for them. Instructors teach sailors how to navigate the Suez in extreme weather and amid steering or engine failures. Mayor says France doesn't get many sandstorms, but there are strong wind gusts that move ships from one side to another. Recently, one of the world's largest cargo ships, the Ever Given, became stuck for six days in the Suez Canal. Mayor says for teaching purposes, canals share a common theme, a waterway with little space to maneuver. Mayor says it's too soon to know exactly what went wrong in the Suez, but that at Port Revel, the goal is prevention. After every accident, we see new clients coming to us because they have been convinced of the interest of our training. Because a training in Port Revel has nothing to do in terms of costs with the immobilization of a ship like the Ever Given for a day. Each day, about 12 percent of global trade passes through the Suez Canal. The stranded Ever Given daily delayed more than an estimated nine and a half billion dollars in trade. Mayor says with stakes that high, big shipping companies may want to consider refresher courses for their staff. Arash Arabasadi, VOA News. From unexpected delays to unprecedented volume, the shipping and maritime industry workforce has had to adapt. Beth Ann Rooney is the Deputy Director of Port Operations under the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. She spoke with plugged in producer Elizabeth Chernoff about the challenges workers have faced in moving cargo and cruise passenger ships in and out of ports. So, you know, we have the benefit of having here what we call the Council on Port Performance. And the Council on Port Performance was, was put in place about five years ago when actually we couldn't handle the volume that was uh, in front of us at the time. And the council brings together senior representatives from every uh, sector in the supply chain to come together and work collaboratively and proactively to address the challenges. So it, it hasn't been easy, but it has been made uh, possible by close relationships, uh, close collaboration, and working together to uh, move the cargoes uh, of the customer. We saw the effect that the supply chain can have on all of us worldwide um, back in March when, of course, the Ever Given uh, container ship got stuck in the Suez Canal for nearly a week. Did that blockage impact operations at the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. About 34% of all of our cargo that is received in the Port of New York and New Jersey comes through the Suez Canal. Uh, so we did have about a dozen vessels that were delayed uh, because of the blockage of the Suez Canal. And just about half of them decided to wait it out and the other half decided to go around uh, the Cape and around Africa. Uh, so what it meant was uh, delays in receiving those ships, uh, but I don't think, uh, at least here in the New York, New Jersey area, folks recognized uh, the impact of uh, that vessel as much as they recognized uh, the impact of global shutdown of production when we were unable to get toilet paper and paper towels, you know, last March and last April. We're, of course, over a year into the, the pandemic, kind of on the 
the upswing with vaccinations in progress. We see across industries, businesses that have been trying to adapt to this new reality. Um, and they will probably face challenges that outlast the pandemic. In the future, um, what are some of the, the strategies that the Port Authority might put in place to handle the workforce and the workflow going forward? In the last 14 months, uh, the port has been up and operating the entire time. And the workforce has already adapted. Uh, and the workforce was quick to adapt. And so uh, the workforce was social distancing before social distancing uh, was uh, the terminology for all of us. Uh, the workforce had put in uh, cleaning protocols and uh, spacing protocols for sharing equipment, uh, again, before the CDC had come out uh, with any guidance. I think what, what the pandemic has taught all of us is uh, with regards to being able to have supplies or materials and goods on hand. So a lot of what we're seeing today in those uh, very uh, steep surges of cargo are manufacturers that are replenishing their stock and also preparing for a just-in-case. So just in case there is another uh, global shutdown, manufacturers have been uh, pushing more and more product into the United States uh, so that it's available to us just in case. In February, the Biden administration ordered a review of critical U.S. supply chains. COVID lockdowns had disrupted many vital production networks. VOA's Arash Erbasidi reports those disruptions led to creative problem solving for organizations delivering life-saving aid. And Deye Sin Dieng walks in the footsteps of her four mothers. Like generations of Senegalese women before her, Dieng dries, smokes, and salts fermented fish caught by the men in her community. But then the pandemic came. Many men stopped fishing. When women found fish, they did not have buyers. Markets closed, borders followed, the supply chain snapped. COVID has changed our work and our life. Since there is COVID, we live in fear. We are afraid to go far and be affected by COVID-19. It has caused a very, very, very big impact on our local community. Dieng's story is one of supply chains. While her local economy suffers, so too do the economies up and down the chain the markets, the mariners, all of the people who make their livings through commerce and trade. The issue also hits home with those working in global health. Gashao Shiferao is senior technical advisor at the nonprofit Management Sciences for Health, or MSH. The organization works with governments in more than 40 mostly low-income countries to provide supply chain solutions to their health programs. Success, he says, is all about getting the right medicines to the right places. You need products to be successful, to have a successful health program uh, implementation. So to get those products, you need to have a system, and that system is a supply chain. These chains are only as strong as their weakest link, and this past year put weak links to the test. COVID is a, a great lesson, which is a disaster. I mean, we, we looked at last year when there is global shortage everywhere, including the United States. That was a panic uh, where the regular supply chain system we have been working, need to, we need to rethink. Shiferao says MSH worked with the government of the Philippines to develop a data collection app that shows the number of resources and areas in need to keep the supply chains moving. He credits years of work on supply chain infrastructure for the last 10 to 15 years, they brought supply chain as part of the whole comprehensive uh, strategy. So they start to give attention. Government starts giving attention to the supply chain. And while he praises governments for embracing supply chains, he says more buy-in from the private sector and a stronger sales pitch from governments is needed. Shifrao says it's essential to consider all of the elements that go into even a single dose of medicine. They need warehouse. You need... Uh, syringes, you need vials, and you need to have a waste management system 
and you need to have even a reverse logistics. It's mind boggling. Ultimately, Shifrao says he's optimistic that global health supply chains are bouncing forward, not back, after the year of the pandemic. Arash Arabasadi, VOA News. As countries around the globe continue the process of loosening restrictions and reopening their communities, supply companies are searching for strategies to boost their recovery. Creating supply chains that are agile and resilient will help suppliers looking for ways to meet consumer demand in the post-COVID world. Thomas Goldsby is a professor of supply chain management and logistics at the University of Tennessee. We spoke about supply chains and the pandemic economic recovery. COVID has had a demonstrative effect on virtually all supply chains. For one thing, very few supply chains are wholly domestic. And that means that we rely upon sources from all over the world to provide us with inputs and ingredients to go into all kinds of products and services. And so, you know, I, I tell my students that unless you are making an apple pie or a Tennessee whiskey, you're going to be relying uh, extensively on global supply chains. And during the pandemic, most companies didn't really realize that they had suppliers who had suppliers that even though they're near, uh, their immediate term suppliers might be nearby uh, in the same region, those suppliers probably relied upon others in very disparate parts of the world. And uh, as a result of uh, the very different nature by which this pandemic has affected different parts of the world, some parts have been uh, very much hampered and others have been able to persevere, but uh, it has slowed supply chains down uh, near and far throughout the world. Our supply chains I liken to finely tuned string instruments. And when they're finely tuned, they sound beautiful and people can enjoy the symphony of life, if you will. However, a little too much tension and those strings start to break. And that's, that's what happened to our supply chains. They have very narrow tolerances for disruption. And uh, of course, we've not witnessed a disruption on the par of, of the pandemic. And so it's taken a considerable amount of time to identify root causes of problems and try to remedy them. People think now are a lot of focus on, on supply chain because we, you know, we've seen so much of the problems associated with COVID, but we can also have, have supply chain problems. For instance, we all saw in March that that, uh, that container ship in the Suez Canal got stuck and blocked all those container ships. And that was disruptive since that's such a short route uh, from uh, Asia to Europe. Um, so, I mean, so are we ready for that type of, uh, of or even a bridge breaking like in Tennessee, your home state? Um, are, are we ready for those disruptions? Well, to varying degrees, uh, some companies have been quite progressive and studying the risk and vulnerabilities present in their supply chains for quite some time and created those options or alternatives that allow them to navigate or pivot safely around uh, those circumstances. And other companies have been left quite flat footed. And I think that this pandemic has exposed those vulnerabilities. And as you point out, a whole host of other factors introduce themselves every day in the highways and byways and and canals that we rely upon to, to transport goods and services. And so it's wise to be thinking about those alternative courses of action before we have to actually call upon them. And I suppose um, natural disasters, tornadoes, hurricanes, um, even climate uh, issues could have an impact on supply chain. Absolutely, all of the above. I've been involved in supply chain risk management efforts for more than a decade, and we've done projects with for-profit companies as well as government agencies. And we sit in a room and we wax philosophic about all the things that could go wrong in a business or supply chain. And then we approach the supply chain partners themselves, the companies, we ask them, what do you, from where you're sitting, what do you, can you imagine going wrong? And the list just grows exponentially. Uh, it's literally thousands of points of defect that could introduce themselves at any point in the sourcing, making, and distribution of products. And there is no such thing as an ironclad supply chain, but we need to create options that uh, allow for alternative paths. Is there some issue about supply chain and the risk that keeps you up at night? Is there something that, you know, that we haven't talked about or people aren't talking about and that we really need to focus on? Well, I think as soon as things settle down a little bit, right now everything's focused on getting products to consumers and doing so at a reasonable price and i think that attention is going to turn pretty soon back to the environmental and societal costs uh, that we incur in making those products and services available 
Uh, as one case in point, the uh, European Union is set to take on uh, issues of diligence, due diligence in supply chains, and I expect that to make quite a bit of news this summer as they think about holding corporate executives criminally liable for doing business in unsavory parts of the world, for instance, using uh, conflict minerals, child labor, forced labor. And I think that those issues are going to come back to the forefront once things settle down a little bit, but those are the things that keep me up at night. Efforts to keep COVID-19 at bay have also created a humanitarian crisis at sea. Hundreds of thousands of mariners and their ships full of cargo have been stranded at sea for months. This has threatened the global supply chain. VOA's Henry Ridgewell reports from London. Ritesh Mera signed up for a four-month contract as captain of a liquid gas tanker in July last year, but he and his crew became stuck on the ship. Coronavirus travel bans meant they were unable to disembark and other crew unable to travel to take their place. So the thought of not being able to go back home in time and the thought of being chained to this particular place and in a way you can also say jailed is getting onto Corona. They are thinking more about it than the actual job at hand. Mera eventually returned home to India in April. There are an estimated 1.6 million seafarers worldwide. In normal times, they work four to six month contracts before crews are rotated. But global travel restrictions made those rotations increasingly difficult, according to Guy Platten of the International Chamber of Shipping. By the autumn, we had well over 400,000 who were far beyond their original contract tour lengths. And some of them have been on board for well over a year, up to 18 months. It's estimated that some 200,000 seafarers are still stranded. India provides tens of thousands of the world's seafarers, and with the surge in cases there, some major ports are banning sailors that have travelled to India, exacerbating the crew shortages. But what we're really feared of now is that just as we were starting to make progress with the new variants, it's starting to get worse again. And of course, with the uh, idea of some sort of vaccine passport being introduced by countries as they come out of COVID, it's just going to go back to square one again. In the waters of Hong Kong, dozens of ships lie at anchor, their crews unable to come ashore because of the pandemic. Reverend Stephen Miller of the local Seafarers Mission runs a supply launch that delivers goods such as mobile phone SIM cards and snacks to the crew members on board. He fears for their mental health. You can just imagine it for yourself. You've been planning to go home, you've been planning to do things for your family or maybe see a young child for the first time uh, in many, many months and that then is taken away from you. So uh, that obviously leads to sadness, which can lead to depression. Several shipping firms, trade bodies and maritime labour organisations have signed the Neptune Declaration on seafarer well-being and crew change. It calls for all nations to recognise seafarers as key workers, allow them to travel and offer them priority vaccines. Chief Officer Karen Marshall spoke to VOA on her way back home to Texas after being stuck at sea for several months. Merchant mariners should definitely be priorities when it comes to getting a vaccine. And the fact that we're not is insane to me. I think companies should work on making their employees, um, getting the vaccine for their employees so that we can start getting back to a normal crew change normal rotations, we can all go back to our families. The signatories to the Neptune Declaration say seafarers will play a vital role in maintaining supply chains required to roll out global vaccination programs, and all countries must recognise them as key workers. Henry Ridgewell for VOA News, London. That's all the time we have for now. Thank you to my guests, Port of Los Angeles Executive Director Gene Soroka, Beth Ann Rooney, Deputy Port Director of the New York, New Jersey Port Authority, and Thomas Goldsby, Supply Chain Expert at the University of Tennessee. Stay up to date on the latest news at voanews.com and follow me on Twitter, at Greta. Thank you for being plugged in. <laughs>